Kevin recently co authored the, this uh, history of uh, Aboriginal literature for Cambridge. It's like uh, Cambridge history of literature, Canadian literature. I've been thinking a lot about where we've come and from and where we are. Um, as you know, Aboriginal literature starts with the oral tradition. And the oral tradition has been around since time immemorial. And what we might call contemporary literature, in one way started, I would say, with life writing. So after the oral tradition, there was documentation of the lives of Aboriginal people, which was usually done by non-Aboriginal people. We've seen a change now, and I would say particularly with the, with the um, uh, establishment of Aboriginal publishers in uh, Temekin out in Manitoba. We have uh, Thetis Books out in the Okanagan. There is uh, Kaganaths. I think they're mostly poetry, but yeah, they're out in Ontario. Anyway, so once Aboriginal publishing became established, you had more and more opportunities for Aboriginal peoples to tell their own stories. This, this occurred late 60s, there's historical reasons for that, into the 70s, and it continued. Um, from life writing, other, other genre, the other big genre was poetry, and there's reasons for that as well. In poetry, as Louise pointed out, I mean, Indian featured people like Duke Redbird, who was one of the first Aboriginal poets to be published widely. There were others as well. Um, but he, he was, his name comes to mind. And that, that book came out late 60s, so it's not that long ago. And why poetry? Because people who were writing poetry had other jobs, they had other lives, they didn't have the luxury to sit down and write a novel or sit down and even write a story. There were certainly oral stories being, being translated but usually those were being translated not necessarily from people in the communities, or at least people in the communities were doing it at times, but they weren't getting the credit. Usually it was uh, academics would come in and take the credit, take the publishing credit. It would be like, Manabush stories by Joe Blow. What? Like, so those kind of things were going on. Later on with Aboriginal publishing, you had more and more Aboriginal people having agency, taking, taking some uh, measure of control. From poetry, then, you had people starting to write short stories, and then, as today, we have all genres. We have novelists, we have people who make professional careers. For the longest time, <coughs> Aboriginal people weren't even considered writers. They were considered storytellers. We were told, no, no, you, you, know, you, you write stories, you write traditional stories, you, you're not professional authors. But now we have, we have everything going on today. There's, um, there's, again, reasons for that. These institutions are the prime example. People started getting degrees, going to college, seeing, as Louise pointed out, other other examples. For previous generations, there were no other examples. There were just very few texts out there actually authored by Native people, so you never really had um, a role model. You only had you know, these, these, these non-Native author texts. So that's changed now. We, we see other, we see ourselves in print. Younger people can actually take Aboriginal literature courses. This has all happened since 90, 1990. There weren't even Aboriginal courses. I think Carleton had one of the first, and I think it was only established in the early 90s. I, I teach at Carleton now. I'm doing those courses, but so that's not very long ago. So that means you would go to a university and study Shakespeare. You would study Brit lit, you would study American lit, you would get some Canadian lit, but you, native authors weren't even in the mix. Maria Campbell, her half-breed, which came out in 1972, was being taught in social work courses. It was being taught in, in uh, sociology courses, whatever. It was not being taught in literature courses. Aboriginal literature didn't, it didn't exist in the mainstream, in the eyes of the mainstream. So, Talk about marginalization. If you were writing Aboriginal literature, where were you publishing? Because people were writing. We had Pauline Johnson at the turn of the last century. 
course, you had all that residential school stuff, but there were still people writing. Where they were publishing is in their own Aboriginal newspapers. You'd go to the newspapers, you wanted to see Aboriginal poetry, you wanted to see some stories, we were publishing ourselves. So that was one of the kind of uh, um, good things that came about with Trudeau's multiculturalism policy because Trudeau said, well, we're going to let all the ethnic groups in Canada publish their own newspapers and everybody will live happily ever after. But what he didn't realize is that Native peoples, we would start publishing our newspapers too through the Native organizations, through the Friendship Center. There was the Native Perspective magazine, which was published through the National Friendship Center. There was Kainai News. There was uh, the all kinds, Ontario Indian, there was Tawal, there was tons, tons of people really wanted to uh, to speak out. So we, we, we saw this opportunity and there was just a flood. If you if you go back now and think of all those, news, some of you are too young, but for those of you who are a little older, if you think of all those native newspapers that were coming out in a very short period of time, you know, we, did, we, we did that ourselves. We said, hey, let's just start publishing. So if you look at them, yes, there's lots of political writing. It's about, you know, ban issues and housing issues, but there was always creative writing in those newspapers. So that kind of led to, to uh, where we are today. That's the forefront of that, of that movement. Then the next step, of course, was these Aboriginal publishing deals, so trade publishing, publishing books. And again, that started in the late 80s with uh, uh, Pemmican, Thetis books, and they're, they're still active today. What's really new for Aboriginal authors is mainstream publishers started to publish Native authors. And this has only happened since the 90s. Uh, it happened actually late 80s with, I mean, you had you had the odd book, again, like Maria Campbell published through uh, McCollum and Stewart. There were the odd one. But where it really started to happen was through theater, 1987. With Thompson Highway's plays, suddenly they were like picked up. They were doing really well. They were published through um, oh, a little publisher out. What's it called? The publisher it was small. It was just a small literary press. But what he did was by just getting his his plays out there, other small literary publishers saw the opportunity. So they started looking for authors. And they started publishing. Now I published with Koto, Louise through Koto, Marilyn through. So all these are literary pub. <laughs> the, these are literary publishers. So they 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 really jumped jumped on board. So that's one of the good things that has happened, and it's it's because they see an opportunity. It's coincided with the development of these liter literature courses that's happened. Obviously, if they didn't see an opportunity, they wouldn't be publishing us. So they see, they see an economic opportunity, and and part of that opportunity is, comes about through these courses that you you have native literature courses here. So since the 90s, they've kind of sprung up like mushrooms across the across the country. Pretty well every university now has at least one native lit course. It's still marginalized. Some sometimes it's not even through in the Department of English. It might be through Native Studies. It might be through Women's Studies. Who knows? But they're there. There's at least one. So these liter literary publishers have fed into those courses. So that's that's where we are today with with our publishing. In terms of autonomy, we have to cert fit a certain criteria. We have to write in a, in a certain kind of way. It's at, at times we have to have the publisher wanting to publish us. They may publish one book and they say, "Well, we've done our native book now. We have our native author." So the, that means the other native authors have to look for other publishers because they maybe don't forget literary publishers can only publish maybe ten books a year themselves. They have very small budgets. Their money all comes from, comes from the Canada Council for the Arts. So even even the small publishers are are you know are jostling for for the dollars. So out of ten uh, of ten books they can publish one year, they might publish one native. Author. So we're all after that same piece of mind. So that's why it's really great to have native publishers on boards. Because they they want to publish us. Um, genre it depends. If you, if you're publishing poetry, there's you know the, the market is very tiny. If mainstream publishers want us to publish novels, they want us to do that kind of work. That that obviously has a larger readership. 
So if you publish a novel, you're better, you're, you know, you're, you're in a position to get a mainstream publisher. And with the mainstream publisher comes all the machinery behind it, all the marketing machinery. So if you publish your book with a little publisher, say off your, I don't know, your, your Xerox machine in Northern Ontario or in Northern Alberta here, likelihood you'll have few readers. If you have McClellan Stewart behind you while well, you're promoting it and getting it into all the, like the Giller, Joseph Borden couldn't have won that book if it hadn't been published by a mainstream publisher because they don't accept any any publisher under 5,000, a printer under 5,000. So even you're limited there. So it has to be a mainstream publisher. So you're, you're uh, there's all these restrictions. Um, so there's always that tension between do I publish with a smaller publisher and do my own thing, or do I try to get a, a bigger publisher? Louise published with one of her poetry books, the McCollum Stewart, and there's good things about that and bad things. She can talk more about that. Um, I'm probably almost out of my time, but um, as far as um, back in the 80s when I was starting to publish, there were no grants for Aboriginal authors. You'd send in your application and just fall into some black hole. But now, uh, there's the Canada Council has its own Aboriginal Arts Secretariat, which is very, very proactive. And they, they have limited funds, but they do what they can. You can call them up, you can go online, so that's been a big boost. Um, it's still, un unfortunately, established authors, we still have access. Now we have uh, access to the grants, and the younger authors who probably need the grants even more don't. So it's still that that problem. I think they're, they're, they have new programs now for, for new authors, so that's a good thing. Ontario Arts Council, where I come from in Ontario, they also have an Aboriginal Arts Secretariat, which is great. They've supported me, and, and um, they've, they've really come through. So, so it, it, it's changed a lot. There's still, there's still that tension, again, between being true to your own writing in the marketplace, but um, good things. Uh, good. When I look back to where we've come from, we've, we've moved 